Stories in JRPGs are weird. They hold much more importance than they do in other genres, but at the same time they can be wildly inconsistent even within the same franchises. Even the best examples of the genre have obvious flaws that can turn off a lot of people. But it's tough to manage a 40 hour plus game without some sort of strong story element. Whether that's character writing, atmosphere, setting, or just an intriguing main narrative, something has to draw you in. There's plenty of examples of games that get one aspect of it so right that it can carry the entire experience, like the setting in Radiata Stories or the character writing in Fire Emblem Three Houses. But when a game struggles to put forth anything, well you get Unicorn Overlord, and the end result is a game that I just didn't like very much. While I do want to focus on story, I'll be talking about the whole game. For some people watching this video, story problems aren't going to be a deal breaker. And for those people, there's a solid strategy RPG in here, so I don't want to do it a disservice. Vanillaware is a company that's never really been on my radar. They made some 2D action RPGs, which wasn't a genre I was really interested in, and most recently made 13 Sentinels, which in theory is a game I would probably like, but every time I watched gameplay of it on YouTube, I lost interest. Still, they've cultivated a strong but niche fan base. And while I'm not really interested in 2D action RPGs or visual novel RTS hybrids, I'm absolutely interested in strategy RPGs. In my eternal quest to find something I like as much as mid-2000's Fire Emblem or the XCOM reboot, I tend to keep my eye on any new stuff that looks interesting. And with an inventive gameplay concept, impressive demo, and rave reviews from a lot of JRPG communities I lurk in, I decided to take the plunge. Real quick before we start, while you may want to call me a hypocrite for criticizing the story when my favorites in the genre are Fire Emblem and XCOM, first, we'll get to that later in the video, and second, I agree. I'm going to be a bit hypocritical in this video. Sometimes it's hard to perfectly articulate why you like one thing and don't like another, especially when you're pretty dumb and had to rely on autocorrect to spell the word articulate when writing a video script. Unicorn Overlord opens in the nation of Cornea, where an evil general has rebelled against the queen and aims to usurp the throne. Faced with inevitable defeat, she sends her son away with a loyal retainer before meeting her implied demise. Said son escapes to an island nation where he bides his time before coming of age and seeking to take back his country. For those familiar with it, this is basically an exact replica of the opening to the original Fire Emblem. I don't actually mind this, as I think it's probably an homage more than anything, especially considering Joseph is also pretty clearly a nod to a character from that game. Unicorn Overlord is a game that wears its influences on its sleeve, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can tell this was made with a lot of love for the genre. After an opening section where you rescue your friend Scarlet, who is essentially Princess Peach with Jiggle Physics, you become somewhat free to roam the gigantic world map. You can follow the story, take on side missions which usually result in recruitable characters, and liberate cities from the control of the evil empire whose name I forgot. These cities tie into another mechanic where you can repair the damages done to them in order to have them auto-generate resources for you. I actually really like the fact that you can roam around the entire map. It's something that doesn't seem like it'd be a big deal, but it makes the progress you achieve much more obviously visible. It also really gives you a sense of scale that a lot of strategy games that rely on just pictures of maps and voiceovers can't really convey. The map is divided into five countries, and you can go at a few of them in any order before it joins back at the end. You can also immediately go into the final mission to take back your homeland right away and get destroyed, which is a nice touch. As you conquer the map, you'll gain progress in the form of honors, renown, and gold. Renown is just a linear path that will unlock some bonuses at various thresholds. Gold is somewhat annoying, not because it's hard to get, but because of how scattered using it is. You'll be able to outfit each member of your team with weapons, armor, and accessories, and these are found at unique shops in each city. While the game does allow you to view which shop sells what on the map, they have limited stock, which means you'll be bouncing around between a bunch of places that sell the same stuff just to outfit your guys. It's busy work attached to what is already busy work in the form of keeping a roster of something like 40 characters fully geared. Honors are in contrast implemented really well. These are rewarded for repairing towns, winning battles, and finishing quests, and are used for buying new unit slots, upgrading the number of characters for each unit, and promoting characters to an advanced class. Combined with the somewhat slow acquisition of honors, the split between usage results in some interesting decision points, especially when you have to choose between upgrading the unit limit and promoting three or four characters for the same price. It causes you to actively think about what's most important, which is what systems like this are designed for. You can also use honors to recruit units, which early on isn't necessary, but later on allows you to pick up some powerful promoted units for a high cost, which is another decision point. Gold Star, this is fantastic design. Each region essentially has its own questline that mostly stands alone while tying back somewhat into the main story. 
You've got your desert nation, your forest full of elves, your snow land populated with furries, all the classics. We'll talk about these a bit more when we touch on the story. Lastly, Vanillaware is well known for having fantastic 2D art, and that holds true here. While I have criticisms of the style, namely with the unnecessary sexualization, the quality is off the charts. It's unique, high quality stuff, and it really gives the visuals a feeling that isn't replicated anywhere else. You may have noticed that I've touched on a lot of stuff related to the battles without talking about them specifically. I wanted to give them their own section. They're pretty unique, so it's easier to explain all at once. Each battle takes place on an isolated version of an area on the world map, with the goal generally being to take over the enemy's main base while protecting your own, although you usually won't have to worry about the latter. You'll move forward throughout the map, taking over enemy bases to stop the flow of reinforcements, deploying new units to bolster your forces, and prioritizing certain targets who can peck away at you from range. There's also side objectives like capturing ruins for items and talking to units to recruit them to your side. Each map has a time limit that usually doesn't come into play but does provide minor rewards if you're quicker. In order to achieve these objectives, you deploy your units from any control base using a resource called Valor. You get a certain amount to start and get more by beating enemies and capturing bases which will allow you to deploy more units as the map goes along. These maps function with very light RTS elements where you give your units a destination and they move in real time. Units have a stamina number associated with them that represents the number of fights they can get into before having to stop and rest. This encourages you to not just have one super squad solo the map. If they encounter an enemy on the map, they fight them. If you win the fight, which is either killing the enemy or doing more damage than they did to you, you lose one stamina and continue along your merry way. If you lose the fight but don't die, you're knocked into a temporary vulnerable state where you can't move and the enemy gets initiative on you. Basically what this means is if you win a fight, you'll almost always just immediately clean up any survivors without trouble. There's some interesting stuff you can do to try and save a unit should they lose a battle, but it mostly involves items and special moves which the enemy doesn't use. Weirdly, this is one of my biggest issues with the game. Outside of a select few bosses, there's no real aspect of attrition or teaming up to take down one enemy. This is such a core aspect of strategy RPGs and even most RTS games that it's just totally lost here. You'll almost never need to use multiple units to take down one or slowly damage them while maneuvering to keep your guys safe. The fact that whoever loses the initial fight becomes a sitting duck means all you need to do is do more damage in one round of combat and you basically win. In theory, there's times where you could position a second unit to come in and take an intentional loss just to soften an enemy up, but you almost never need to do this. The only times I did were when I was training up weaker units, and these situations resulted in some of the most fun gameplay I had the entire run. This felt like the only time I needed to think several moves ahead. On top of this, you're also given access to a bunch of special attacks you can use for Valor that will do the job of softening an enemy up much safer. We'll talk more about those in just a second. The unit-on-unit -unit battles themselves are the most interesting and unique aspect of the game, and despite all the problems I'm going to talk about in this video, this uniqueness can probably carry the game for a lot of people. Unicorn Overlord is essentially a combination of the unit construction you can find in games like Ogre Battle or Soul Nomad, with an in-depth order system similar to the Gambits from Final Fantasy XII. You'll set each unit with individual soldiers, two or three to start but eventually expanding to five. You can position these to fit their strengths, like bulkier units up front or spreading units out horizontally to avoid piercing attacks. When the battle begins, each soldier will execute their skills as you've set them up in a system that's just called tactics, which is a really common term, so for clarity's sake, I'm just going to call them gambits. Each gambit can be set up with different flags, and you can get really specific with this stuff. You can have an ability only be used against a certain type of enemy, mark a skill to only be used if a character is at low health, and even weird shit like only use this attack if it's the fourth attack made in the battle. There's a few small gaps here, namely that I found it difficult to force buffs onto specific units, but for the most part this system is fantastic. Testing out a unit in mock battles and seeing how fixing the gambits can change them from a weak unit into an unstoppable juggernaut is awesome, and it rewards experimentation in a way that can be extremely satisfying. You can also edit these right on the fly before a battle, adjusting things to take down a tougher enemy or to keep your units alive. This game is an absolute goldmine for people who like to fiddle with shit. From unit equipment to balancing passive skills and active skills to making granular strategy adjustments, there's almost always something you can do to swing power level through ingenuity. All of that sounds great, and it is, but it's pulled down by two big issues. The first is how excessive this stuff gets at higher levels. Once you get into the part of the game with promoted characters, along with five-man squads on both sides, there's so many different variables that controlling all of them is pretty much impossible. 
I found the system incredibly fun early on. It had that awesome click moment when I realized I could delay a character's attack in the turn order to make it so they would always get buffed right before executing it. But as the game expands, doing stuff like this becomes unreasonable. There's so many different attacks and situations to account for that it feels extremely bloated once you get towards the second half of the game. And the biggest issue in the game also crops up in the second half. While messing around with gambits can be extremely rewarding, in the early game you'll find it becomes less and less worth it for one main reason. The game is just way too easy. Even on the hardest difficulty, there's no point in spending all this time making micro adjustments when you can just leave gambits on default and stomp 95% of enemies. You also have access to a whole bunch of those valor skills I mentioned earlier, which in theory add a lot of depth to the decision making in the RTS portions, but in practice you just don't need them. Once you get enough room in the party to add a healer and a debuffer without compromising offense, you're basically set for the rest of the game. I found myself not doing experimentation with unit compositions and gambits because I needed to, but just for the sake of it. I think a decent chunk of this is on a mechanical level. The fact that there isn't really a middle point between winning and losing means even a slight victory is just the same thing as a full victory. In this sense, each battle is almost always going to be extremely easy or extremely hard, and it's almost always the former. But look, this is a 40 or so hour game, and it felt rewarding and interesting to experiment for the first 25 or 30 hours. Plenty of strategy RPGs lurch their way towards the end after the player figures out what works, but that doesn't mean the journey there isn't still worth taking. If some of the stuff I talked about sounds interesting, there's a pretty extensive demo available, so I definitely recommend giving that a download and seeing if it grabs you. I'm about to go into the story, and I'll just be upfront that it's going to be almost entirely negative. But if story doesn't matter to you, I don't want to stop you from giving the game a try. <laughs> There's going to be some spoilers for this section, although I won't spoil the final chapters. I can pretty confidently say that nothing here the story does is going to surprise you anyway, but there's a warning if you need it. After a relatively simple and inoffensive opener, the problems begin on the very first map, where you take on one of your mother's former retainers. Upon map completion, you approach the boss, and your super secret special heirloom ring starts glowing, and this happens. Oh, my head. What am I doing here? A spell to shackle the hearts of men. Tis the only way I can think to describe it, my prince. Now, I don't record my reactions when I play through this stuff, but luckily a streamer whose playthrough I happened to watch had the exact same reaction. What sorcery is this? Was he being mind controlled? <sighs> He actually was. Oh my god. What am I doing here? The fuck? Without so much as Man, a mind control is the worst plot ever. Immediately, the stakes for this whole thing are lowered. The bad guys aren't bad, they're just mind controlled. I don't want to get too hung up on this point because you can utilize something like this pretty well in a story, with Final Fantasy VII as an example where it ties in thematically with Cloud's PTSD and manufactured identity. But damn if this isn't a really sour first impression to me. It immediately establishes that a lot of the potential war stories have is out the window. Seeing good people on the other side of a conflict just due to circumstance is a great jumping off point for character growth, and it's almost totally absent here. The game essentially follows a structure where each country has a separate story thread with connections back to the main conflict of taking on the rather nondescript evil empire. These threads introduce you to the background of a country, some lore about them, and then sees you aiding their inhabitants with taking back their land. Do this four times and you'll push through to the end. The later ones get shorter as it begins to lead into the final mission. The four regions consist of a desert country, an elven forest, a snowy area populated by furry OCs, and a religious island with angels and a pope. Their stories are almost entirely separate and self-contained. A brief conflict is introduced, you clear some people of mind control, beat a cartoonishly evil villain, and move on. The connecting through line of the evil empire mostly just shows itself in the form of these villains who are trying to accomplish some standard evil shenanigans. We'll go into more details here in a second. I want to briefly touch on why story still matters even in a genre where it can often be an afterthought. Even in the series I mentioned earlier, like XCOM and Fire Emblem, I constantly find myself revisiting the ones which have some form of story strength. Three Houses over the Mechanically Superior Engage, Radiant Dawn over the Mechanically Superior Fates, and even XCOM Enemy Unknown felt like a better first playthrough to me than the Mechanically Superior XCOM 2. The story doesn't have to suck you in, and it certainly doesn't have to be the focus, 
but in longer games, stories help you get through some of the low points in gameplay and give you a desire to start up the game again, rather than letting it slowly recede from your memory until you eventually uninstall. Even bad stories can be somewhat entertaining if they're self-aware about it, but bland stories are the ones that cause people to drop games. But as I've said, there's tons of different ways a story can excel, so I'm going to take a look at some of the ones I mentioned and talk about why I don't think Unicorn Overlord hits any sort of benchmark in them, as well as examples of games that do hit those benchmarks. The main story of Unicorn Overlord feels like a traced drawing. Certain parts seem to have been lifted one-to-one -one from other series like Fire Emblem and Ogre Battle, and the meandering nature of the structure prevents any sort of momentum from building. At no point did it challenge preconceived notions, at no point did it utilize its premise well, and at no point did I ever truly get invested. The main villains are so cartoonishly evil that it removes all stakes from the conflicts in each region, and there are very few instances where any antagonist feels fleshed out or even in some small way sympathetic. However, this is the part I want to spend the least time on. Very few strategy RPGs have a compelling main plot, and often it just serves as a staging point for the other strengths. The far more common strength games in this genre do have is the setting. A war is such an inherently interesting backdrop to learn more about the world and draw you in, and games like Three Houses, Final Fantasy Tactics, and Triangle Strategy have utilized that backdrop to great effect. The nature of being able to slowly introduce the player to the world in the background of a greater conflict is a uniquely intriguing part of strategy games. This sort of goes hand in hand with atmosphere, as there's a lot more room to explore different tones and themes in something as broad as war. This is where I would contend that XCOM Enemy Unknown had its strength, as the slow unraveling of a mysterious enemy is what hooked me when I first played it. Unicorn Overlord doesn't have any of that. The nations of the world are generic to an absurd degree, and adhere so much to uninteresting fantasy tropes that it never feels like a truly established setting. The segmented nature of the story also stunts these regions from getting fleshed out, as there's almost no information on how these countries interact with each other or what place they occupy. Fire Emblem Path of Radiance is a game that also has some relatively generic starting points. A gigantic religious empire, a land of furries, a small neutral kingdom whose name might as well have been Invade Me, but it spends so much time hammering out the conflicts and relationships of these countries that it all felt more like a world. Unicorn Overlord is content to leave everything by itself, like each region was written separately and then put together at the end. This lack of cohesion hurts the atmosphere as well. You never feel the weight or seriousness of war, how relationships between countries or daily life within countries have changed because of it. These lands might as well have not existed until you get there and might as well stop existing when you leave. The only relics of importance from your actions in liberating them are the party members you picked up on the way who stop appearing in cutscenes when you leave their country anyway. And let's talk about those characters for a second. There's a ton of them here, some you pick up as part of the main story, but a huge chunk who only get introduced via side content. While they don't usually appear in main story cutscenes after this, they do get some spotlight through the rapport system, which is basically just supports from Fire Emblem. Have compatible units fight together enough and you'll unlock short cutscenes where they expand on their relationship and flesh themselves out a bit more. The format here of putting most of the character development in optional conversations is fine, but those conversations as well as the dialogue from the characters in the main story is another weak point. The style here is very Arthurian. Most characters speak very formally with one another and don't really talk like real people. This isn't actually that damning, it's a common way to write fantasy games and you can still have interesting characters and relationships by having them carve through the formality. A good example of this is Final Fantasy XII, which has the same type of dialogue, but switches things up by telling the story through the lens of a street urchin. It can also make side characters who are less formal more interesting by comparison. Unicorn Overlord once again struggles to make any of this happen. The biggest problem is that what feels like half the cast is the same exact character. Formal, honorable, benevolent, kind, and any other Mary Sue trait you can think of. Watching support conversations between two characters who essentially rolled the same lawful good D&D character over and over is brain pummelingly frustrating. The few standouts are almost always side characters and almost never get any sort of development beyond their base character traits. It's a game with 60 playable characters where I genuinely struggle to think of a single one that I'd call exceptional. I had party members who I used for the entire 40 hour game whose name I would forget in cutscenes until they talked. The main character is the biggest issue but also the most excusable. Having a bland Mary Sue protagonist is basically par for the course in the genre, but there needed to be other characters that stepped up around that protagonist. And that blandness is Unicorn Overlord's biggest weakness. 
Like I said earlier, bad but self-aware stories can have charm. Be Unicorn Overlord is a game that's extremely bland, but plays everything completely straight. It felt so joyless, so basic and inconsequential that it's hard to believe it occupies the same disc as a game which clearly had so much passion put into the strategy aspects. There were no risks taken here and no particular aspects that were focused and polished. Game stories can struggle at these aspects individually. Bad settings, bad character writing, atmosphere, main narrative. But when a game struggles with all of them at the same time, it starts to weigh the experience down. I really struggled to finish this game, and to be perfectly honest, I probably wouldn't have if I wasn't going to make a video on it. Unicorn Overlord is a game with good ideas in one half spoiled by a lack of care in the other. The unique gameplay sections feel inspired and interesting even if they're let down a bit by lack of difficulty and over complexity. But the story seems uninterested in pulling its weight, uninterested in wanting to do anything more than the bare minimum. For some people who just want an inventive strategy RPG, this might not be a deal breaker. But for me, it was. Because of that, Unicorn Overlord is a game I can't recommend. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider liking or leaving a comment. It helps the video not get lost in the YouTube algorithm. These videos take a lot of effort to make, so if you're interested in supporting, I'll put a buy me a coffee link in the description.